<laughs> All right. So we're going to start a flow flow of control. Uh, the programs we've been dealing with before, you know, they just kind of go sequential, one after the next after the next. But clearly, you can't do nothing but the simplest of programs like that. So today, we're going to talk about uh, uh, something that's called like structured programming. The structured programming says we can go sequentially. We can go, we can take one path or another path, and we can go loose, and then we have things organized nicely by functions, which we've kind of been talking about. So that's what we're going to go today. The slides are available here, and we have two uh, short sets of source code that we'll go over. The rough outline is I'm going to talk to you about algorithms, flowcharts, and pseudocode, branching, looping, and then we've got a little programming assignment that we did in the class. So, who here can articulate a great definition of an algorithm? No one's looking at me. No way. Uh, an algorithm would be step-by-step -step instructions that anybody, a computer or a person, can follow to achieve an end goal. It's a pretty good definition. Yeah, it's a good definition. By the end of the term, you'll, by the end of today, you'll need to know the term algorithm. I'll give you a, a shorter one. More precise one. Well, not more precise, but, but shorter. You better know how to use some operators. Some operators make calculations, be able to interpret flowcharts. Who here has worked with flowcharts? Who here has not worked with flowcharts? Most of us have seen them in one form or fashion. And after today, you're going to be an expert at them, Dave, I promise. They are not hard to become an expert at. We'll do pseudocode. Who's heard of pseudocode? <clears throat> Kat, you heard of pseudocode? Curtis? Okay. What is pseudocode? What should we call it? If you were to describe it to Kat, you've never heard of it. It's easy for you to get code down the table without having to worry about it. That's not a bad description. Okay? Not a bad description. <clears throat> we're also going to come up with some relational operators. And just real quickly, because I'm not going to spend much time on this stuff. Less than, less than or equal to, not equals, equals equality. Remember that the single equal sign of job is assignment. Greater than or equal to, Ready up. Pretty straightforward stuff. We're going to cover the if statement and the while statement. We won't do do while and for loop, but I'll give you a hint that any do while loop or any for loop that you write in any programming language can be rewritten as a while loop. So if you know how to do a while loop, you know how to do any other loop. These do whiles and for loops are really just syntactic sugar. Everything can be done with the while loop. Later, when you get to test, when we do program graphs, you'll see that as a graph, they're, they're, they're the exact same things. So let's do algorithms and representations. What are some different ways to represent a program? We're going to start with algorithms first. These are just the recipes for how we solve problems. Let's say, for example, the problem we wanted to solve was to bake a cake. You would have the ingredients and the steps you need to put those together. Cookies, same way, make a sandwich. Eric, what's the algorithm for making a sandwich? Bread. <laughs> yes, yeah, no, exactly, no, 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 exactly. You, you get two pieces of bread, you, you, you put some mayo on it, you put some bread on it, then you put some cheese and you put some lettuce, bam, you give us the algorithm for a sandwich. It's really, no, it really is that straightforward. It's just a sequence of steps to solve a particular problem. That's it. It's a fancy word, I guess, people who wanted to feel high and mighty about themselves made up. It's just a sequence of steps. It's a recipe is the great metaphor. It's just a recipe for how to solve a problem. It may not be very precise, but that could be a general solution for an algorithm. It could be, you know, two pieces of bread, some meat, some cheese. But is that solve? Every, does that describe every sandwich? No. Does it, is it specifically says, well, we're going to get some white bread that's this size, and we're going to put it down on a table like this, and then we're going to get one exact tablespoon of mayo, and we're going to put that down and put a little salt and pepper on there? You know, you know, it's not precise, but it still can solve the problem. When it gets that precise, then we're actually writing the program. So let's take a look at our dog years problem from 
the assignment last Friday, um, which I think most of y'all did not do when I looked at it yesterday. I think I only had a couple submissions. I don't remember. So here's the, here's the dog ears. In the body of the student workshop method, write a small program that will prompt the user for the name, then their age, it will calculate their age in dog ears, which is age times seven, display the ASCII dog, and then the statement, your name is X years old in dog ears. Then put your code in there. So here's an algorithm to solve that problem. Prompt the user for the name, prompt the user for the age, calculate their age of dog years, render the ASCII dog, print your name is dog years old, done. Ricky? No. If I gave you this, could you write this program? Yeah. Without even thinking about it, right? Pretty straightforward. Easier than the last one. Possibly. So, what I, what I just showed you was pseudocode. That's what pseudocode looks like. It's just this informal programming-ish language that typically takes, you know, you pick some keywords out of a language. That's it, there's no real rules to it. Pseudocode. There's no real syntax, there's no real key terms, there's no real grammar. We just saw a high level version of it. But I'm gonna give you a little bit lower level version. So here's a little bit more granular pseudocode for the same problem. First, we'll initialize name and age. We'll print what's your name. We'll input the name. We'll print what's your age. We'll input the age. We'll multiply by seven. We'll print the ASCII dog. Then print the name and age in dog ears. That's much more narrow, right? Ricky, if I gave you this, could you write this program? <laughs> this was, this seems like it would be much easier to write than even the last two. Cat, if I gave you this, could you write this program? Hope. Oh. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I'd be doing more than hoping because we got an exam coming Friday. Reminder, right? And you will be doing some programming on the exam. Big hint. There aren't any rules, it's, but there are a couple suggestions. This first one is when we have dependency, we'll indent it. So let's say, you know, if the dog, you know, if years was over 500, then we'll kind of indent print, you're really old, for example. And we'll indent that to denote that's executed, you know, conditionally. We should use keywords that are close to sounding like a programming language, you know? Like calculate, input, print, increment, initialize, initialize. The things that we say when we, when we talk about programming, that's what we should use here. Okay? But that's, that's really it. Now, I, you saw that I, I initialized some values. You don't need to declare any. You, know, you don't need to declare and permute all your variables you're ever going to use. I just initialized the big key ones that we kind of needed to solve the problem. So it, it, it's a format for us to do two things. One of them, it's a very, very inexpensive way to flush out our design for the program. Secondly, it gives us another easy way to communicate a solution. So I could give that slide to each one of you independently, and you all could write it, and you, you probably all have a very, very similar solution to that. It may not be exact, like your text might be different in your prompts, but the fundamental aspect of the program will all be the same. And that's what, that's what pseudocode does. It's not a specification. It's not a specification. So another way we represent, represent this, now Dave, pay attention, is with a flowchart. Now I'm gonna make you a flowchart expert in about 30 seconds, watch. Flowcharts have three symbols that we care about in this class. One are the terminals, starting and end terminals. There's these capsule shapes. This is where we indicate the start of the flow, this is where we indicate the end of the flow. Next. Every step is put into a rectangle. We connect these with arrows. Finally, if we have some kind of decision, we indicate it with a diamond with the label yes on the branch that follows it that if that decision is true, no if the decision is false. We typically describe these with a question. So they always have a question mark. Easy, right? Let's take a look at our, our dog ears program. 
We start with prompt for the name, prompt for the age, tap the dog years, print the ASCII, print the name and age of years, and then we end. Ricky, if I gave you this, would you write this program? Uh, maybe if I had heard. <laughs> but, but you see what we're doing here, right? Now, if I gave you that problem, and you spent just a couple minutes sketching out the pseudocode or this function, you probably improve your efficiency of programming. Because you kind of thought through what you're going to do. Then it's just, oh, now I know what I'm going to do. Let me go translate this to code. Right? It, that's really what these tools should be used for. That's really what these should, should be used for. They should be used for you to think through your solutions to these problems. They're just they're lightweight, loose tools. I don't, you know, we don't get, there's, there's all sorts of different symbols and, and flowchart and flowchart diagram. There's data roles and this, and there's all kinds of different steps. But really, as these little thought exercises kind of flesh out designs and solutions, you know, you got those three, then you'll be good enough. Syntax is very loose, same with pseudocode, very loose, nice tools to, to figure something out. If you're staring at a blank screen in your IDE, maybe grab a piece of paper and draw some boxes and arrows. Flow of control. So we saw that decision marker that suggests, that foreshadowed that well, sometimes we need to branch and execute code conditionally. And this is what we call branching. And that's what it does. This allows us to select, based upon some condition, to execute this code or that code. I'm going to introduce a new term here. I've been talking about it a lot. I use this phrase a lot, but here's a new term. When I say a block of statements, a block is a series of statements. In Java, we can denote it with the parentheses. That's why at the beginning of a method, you see the open parentheses and closed parentheses. That's considered a whole block. In an if statement, we can have an if and then an open parentheses and a closed parentheses. If that if is true, everything in there would be executed. You can even put your code in, like any main method, just put it in parentheses if you wanted to. So this is a group of statements that should be executed together. So for if, for if statement, this is if whatever expression is true, then execute this statement. Now no, I don't have these in blocks. If you do an if statement without blocks, it will only execute the next line. Even if you've indented, 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 it will only execute the first line. Now as part of a coding standard in this class, when, I, when we introduce it, we require even single lines to be indented. So it's very, very clear what's being executed. I mean, to, not to be indented, I mean to be in curly braces. You can also have an if else statement, and an else, an else statement says, if this is true, do this, otherwise, do this. It says, if this is true, do this. Otherwise, start here and start executing. Here's the block syntax. If this is true, execute all these statements. If this is true, execute all these statements. Otherwise, execute all these statements. Okay? Else if. If this is false and this is true, then execute these statements. If this is false and this is false, then execute these statements. If this is true, you don't execute anything else, regardless. So if this is true and this is true, it won't execute the second block. As soon as it hits true, it's done. So if you wanted it to be, if this is true and if this is true, do this stuff, how would you write that for key? Both of you guys are close. I think that if this was true and this was true, do this stuff, I would probably put it inside here. Because in your, in your case, Curtis, actually, that would probably work, too. Just put it in here, too. You can do either or. But in Curtis's case, if this wasn't true, then this wouldn't execute. But I don't see anybody going, wow, Dr. Dennis, this is amazing stuff, so I figure this is pretty basic for many of you, right? Brian? Okay. Here's our example. Let's go back to our dog years problem. And here's the new requirement. If the person's dog years age is less than 21, print out you're just a pup. A young pupper. 
Here's what our pseudocode would look like. I, I shorted some. Input the age, multiply by seven, print ASCII dog, print the name and age of dog years. If dog years is less than 21, notice the indention, printer just a pup. Ricky, if I gave you this, could you solve this? Yeah, yeah absolutely, right? Here's our flow chart. We start, prompt for name, prompt for age, calculate dog years, print ASCII dog, print name and age of years. If the dog uses less than 21, we'll go up here. We'll flow this way. Print your pot and end. No, we'll end there. Ricky, if I gave you this, could you do this? Absolutely. Right? I'm using that. I'm trying to hammer the point on. See? This stuff is easy. Nick, could you do this? Okay. I'm going to ask you to do that at the end of class. I'll do it right now. Were you? <laughs> the assignment I'm giving at the end of class you were doing right now? No, trying to get your own I was trying to do the... Um, oh, the dog years one? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Selection is straightforward. Branching is straightforward. We use if statements. We have some, some different syntax. Do compound if statements, etc. Who's heard of a case statement? Select case. Little tidbit. You can write any select statement as a series of ifs. All you need to know is if and while, and you can be a very, very good programmer. Those are the core pieces. Let's take a look at this source. I'm going to do this fast because this is, this is put, I'm putting you all to sleep. I can see it. This is just some different syntax. If this is true, print it out. If it's false, this will be an expression. If this is true, we'll print out the entire block. This is true, we'll print out here, we won't print out the else statement. And then down here, on the else, else if, on the if, else if, the, the or evaluation, the order evaluation starts at the top, it works down until it hits true, then it stops evaluating. That's where a lot of people get tripped up. They think if this is true and this is true, that both of these will print. Okay? As soon as it hits true, it'll stop evaluating. If I had 100 of these else ifs, would stop as soon as it hit true. They're not sequential. Okay, short quiz time. You can grab this out of the source, or you can type it in. Um, if you go to the to the lecture, then go to the selection source code.
We're still asleep. Yeah. So there's about three of you left. Who needs more time? Joe? First one looks like everybody got. Most people got the second one. A little, little bit of confusion on the third one. Let's look at the third one. Three. So this is not equals. So is 10, is 10 not equal to 15? That's true. So since that's true, this will print. Uh, most people got this next one right. Oh, then we've got some some contrast on the bottom. Actually, we know yours, Brian, was a misreading, right? Yeah. Okay. So that's this one. I was the one previously. Yeah. <laughs> this is Brian, everyone, right here. <laughs> he did that. <laughs> I knew it was right, though. I knew what was right, but I clicked it wrong. Yeah, so here we go again, where this is also true. Right? But only this one's the one that executes. It hits true, then it stops. Stops processing this structure. Most of you got that right. And everybody got the what the operators were. All right, you got? Okay, let's move on to the next section. So we saw how to branch. Now let's cover how to repeat. This is where we have keywords like while, for, and do while that will let us repeat some block of code however we like, however much time we like. Again, here's the block. We can repeatedly execute a block based upon some condition. Here's the syntax. While the expression that no matter how big or how compound it is, it must resolve down to true or false. If you make an assignment in here, like you say x equals 1 or x equals true, you might get some unspecified behavior because is x equal to true when it executes that assignment, what does that return? Right? So be careful that you don't do assignment, that you do equality, not assignment there. Like with the if statement, you can repeat a single line. It'll do a single line. It won't do anything after that. We can also put it in curlies. Uh, the, the, the coding standard will require this when you get one. So let's talk about dog ears. So this is a classic way that console input would work. So continue to ask for the name and age until the user exits by entering in a queue. So if you see a queue, you want to exit, right? We don't want to be sitting there in an infinite loop going on forever. So let's, how does our pseudocode now work? While not quitting, let's initialize the name and the age. Let's print what's your name, dot, dot, dot. Let's print the name and age and dog years. And I should have that here. If name is equal to Q, if name is Q, then quit it. Then we're quitting. And that would be down here. Okay? Or actually, maybe somewhere after the input your name. Would want to check that. So here's our flow chart. So we'll start, pop the name. If it's Q, then we want to exit. If it's if if it's not Q, then we'll prompt for the age, calculate the dog years, print ASCII, print the name of the age in years. If dog years is less than 21, we'll say yes, you're a pup, we'll come back in a loop. Say no, we'll just come back and loop. Ricky, if I gave you this, oh. you implement it. Oh. Uh, yeah, absolutely, right? This we without getting into the syntax and the specifics, we've got our solution right here. Curtis says, I can do it with the pseudo code too. And the right Curtis. Matter of fact, I think he's doing it like Nick over here was. Straightforward. 
Dave, would you consider yourself an expert at flowcharts now? Can you read this flowchart? Because you are an expert. And he didn't even know the flowcharts were got here. This is, a, this is how straightforward this is and how smart Dave is. Okay? Yeah, <laughs> That's right. Dave is now become a resident expert in flowcharts. So, looping's easy. Looping's easy. I'm going to show you two examples here. So this first one, system.out.print line, the value of x is 100, while x is less than 200, increment x. What is this going to print, Patrick? The value of x is, uh, yeah, so like, down here, what's it going to say down here? Yeah, the value of x is whatever it is, so I'm going to add one. Eric? It'll be 200 a kilo. Yeah. So, okay, he says it's going to print every time. Joe, what's it going to print? I got a lot. Um. <laughs> what, okay, what's, read this code. Okay. What's this line going to print here? This is compared from X to 100 to 200. Patrick, you want to revise? Just prints out as X is 200. Raphael? Uh, I think it's going to print X from 101 to 200. Danny? X, uh, value of X is 200. Cat? Yeah, yeah. Brian? 200. Of course, sure, but you said you guys were going to cheat with each other. You can help with chemistry, you can help me with this. Can I I heard. <laughs> you listening to it. It's gonna print two hundred. Yeah, I forgot. Is it gonna print one ninety nine? Okay, so so you guys. So the reason why it's not gonna print this every time is because without the brackets, it's only gonna do one line. Okay, so the instruction point, and this is what goes on. There's an instruction point that says here I'm gonna execute this line, then I'm gonna execute this line, then I'm gonna execute this line. Then I'm going to execute this line. Then I'm going to come back and we're going to execute this line. Then I'm going to execute this line. I'm going to come back up. I'm going to execute this test. X is less than 200. On and on. Then as soon as X is not less than 200, it's going to go up to here and then it's going to jump over that line and hit this. Now, if, if these were in brackets, like this, then it would have printed every time. Okay? The reason why it's not 199 because of the order of how this executes. So let's let's trace this. Let's say x is 198. And let's watch what happens. It hits this line, is x less than 200? Yes. So this is true. This can commit x. x is now 199. Can it hit this line? Is x less than 200? That's true. So it's going to execute this. x becomes 200. Now it's going to hit this line, is x less than 200? It's false, so it's going to skip and break out of there. Okay? That's why it's not 199. Now, there is a structure called a do while, which where the syntax is kind of reversed, where you have do up here and you have while down here. We just flip where the condition is being checked. And if you had x down here, if you had x is 200 down here, it would, when this hit 200, Actually, it would still work the same way, right? Yeah, okay. I was wrong this morning. I better not put that video up on YouTube. I'll put this one up on YouTube. <laughs> Those poor kids are going to get it wrong in the exam. I'm kidding. All right. <laughs> uh, no, I was thinking that, that that would behave differently for some reason. But no, it would, it would be the exact same. There are situations where it wouldn't. That's just not one of them. So let's look here. This is this is a classic way to handle console input. So we'll initialize and declare our scanner, our standard, our standard in. Then we'll set some flag, some sentinel that says while we're not quitting, while it's quitting is false. 
then while not is quitting, do this stuff. Okay? While we're not quitting, do this stuff here. Then we're going to print out enter any string Q or big Q to quit. Then we're going to grab the line in. Now note, I'm giving you a new method here that equals ignores case. So this is, check to see if this is equal to Q regardless whether it's capitalized or not. Here's a little flexibility of the user. If we're quitting, set is quitting to true. Then otherwise, we'll print out you entered this. So we'll, we'll loop, enter any string, and we'll keep printing out until the user hits, till the user puts a Q in. If it puts in a Q in, this gets flipped, and we break out of the loop. Yeah? Is that a better way to do it than actually breaking? Well, so it depends. So break is a keyword that what it will do is when it, when it hits break, it'll change control up to here and then break out. So it'll come up to here and come down afterwards. Now, had I had a bunch of stuff in here, I, and not this else statement or something like that, I'd probably put a break. But just to show this example, and the other thing I wanted to show was how I phrased this semantically using my variables. Like, I deliberately chose to, so that this read like we would write it while I'm not quitting. Okay, so see, because you like you could write this as while not quitting, or or yeah, not quitting. Then you while then then the root like while not 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 quitting, or something like that. So you want to choose your variable name so that the semantics of when you're reading this it makes sense. Does that make sense, Joe? So this reads now is quitting is equal to true. I know what's going to happen. I don't have to try to flip an invert. In the corollary to break, by the way, is continue. Okay. If you have a continue, what a continue do will do, the continue will hit this keyword here, then keep executing this loop. Jump back up to the top. One jumps up, breaks, and then comes to the bottom. So tactically the same as just jumping to the bottom. This one jumps, goes back to the top. So any questions about that? This for your experts? Uh, I have a question. The not sign of the not sign before it's quitting just change the value of quitting to true. Yeah, it, it inverses the the oper It inverses this right here. Exactly. Now we haven't really covered that yet. But we'll cover that next week. Boolean operators. But I want to show this early because I want you to. I want this because this reads. This reads like it, it behaves. Okay, so this this hits false. False becomes true. Right. In this expression, it flips the, the value. But no, it does not change what's stored in the variable it's quitting. Right. So I'm not doing an assignment. Okay. Okay, so I have a little assignment for you. We got about 15 minutes. So here's the program. Write a small program that will prompt the user for a phrase, then prompt them how many times to repeat the phrase, display the phrase as many times as was entered, and repeat this until the user enters and quit. Okay? So it's gonna be like enter in a phrase, so I'll put in Brad. How many times do I repeat it? I'll put in 10. Then you'll print Brad 10 times. Then you ask me again. Raphael, make sense? Okay, 15 minutes. If this is super easy for you, then you probably be in fair shape for the exam. If this is an incredible struggle for you, then you should do some practice in between now and Friday. <laughs>